So MoMA started uh, as an infill project mid-block on 53rd Street as a townhouse. So it, was, it started as a very domestic uh, environment in which to see art and to ponder art. It was an experiment for modernism. It wasn't really a museum but in a traditional sense. And it was built in the international style. It was quite jarring at the time to, to have this building here uh, in the middle of these uh, sort of ornate Beaux-Arts uh, mansions. This is an extension of the Bauhaus stair. The Bauhaus stair was part of the original Goodwin and Stone uh, building. It linked the second and third floors. So we, being archaeologists in a way, looked through all of the old documents of the, of the museum and discovered that that stair had been there and proposed to make it, uh, to bring that stair um, down again. And, and the hope uh, was with that and with many of our interventions to make the flow through the museum much more um, intuitive and that visitors can put together their own kind of tour. The way the stair is made is reminiscent of uh, the original Bauhaus stair, which you can see if you look up uh, here. That original stair was made of concrete. It was kind of cumbersome. It was 1939. There hadn't been a technological advancement of material research that we brought to the project in extending the stair uh, with a very thin steel plate um, that cantilevers from the wall and suspends um, this very heavy uh, rise and run uh, layer of terrazzo, which in turn holds the, the, holds the handrail uh, by uh, being set into the terrazzo. All three materials are working symbiotically together to make a new system um, that pushes the, the performance of each of the materials individually, but collectively makes something that's quite unique and beautiful. Here we opened up the passage to the western part of the museum. We also were able to find an old mechanical room, take all of the equipment out of that room, and turn that space into a new lounge space, sort of based on the DNA of the original Goodwin Stone building, but with its own character. Uh, you see the stone coming back. You see one of the recurring themes of our expansion, which is a kind of carpet inlaid into the existing floor material to give it a domestic quality. Most people probably won't recognize all of the work that went into this expansion and renovation. DSNR and Gensler, our associates, touched almost every part of the museum, but in very, very surgical ways. Um, the idea was to bring more art to more people without tickets to the street uh, and to everyone um, uh, to essentially turn the museum inside out. Uh, right now, we're in Philip Pereno's installation that takes up the entire lobby. The only way that that was possible was because we were able to drain all the desking operations, the ticket counter, the membership desk, out of the lobby um, and put them in rooms on the side. So all of the crowds that were previously associated with this space will all be pulled to the sides, liberating the space to be uh, a free of charge gallery. One of the things we tried to do uh, with this expansion and renovation was bring back a sense of the domestic scale uh, and the domestic material quality. So in the new expansion you'll see in many locations wood used as flooring but also as ceiling and walls um, that make a much more intimate uh, space. Um, you'll see wood and other materials inlaid into the existing floor, uh, almost like the carpet. Uh, in a house uh, and, and um, lounge furniture put on top of that to give it uh, a, a kind of intimate feel. But the thing that we've done that you can't see and you probably can't hear it in the video is we've worked with other senses, uh, in particular um, acoustics. In the lobby now, you can hear a difference. It's much quieter. Uh, everything is uh, kind of hidden. You wouldn't exactly know what we've done, but we've hidden acoustic absorption underneath all the wood floors. We have acoustic plaster on the ceiling. Uh, all of these things add up to making a much more peaceful um, experience, even when a lot of people are here. We believe that that, that will be an appreciable difference, that people will, will um, will have their visit punctuated by these moments of repose and quietness that will make uh, appreciating the art much, much easier.
we're standing in the project room. The project room is on the ground floor. Um, we we convinced MoMA to work uh, with us to make as much of the ground, well, all of the ground floor ticket free and to bring galleries back to the ground floor. The project room previously existed um, in uh, other iterations of MoMA prior to the Taniguchi edition. In fact, it's the place that Diller and Scofidio, before I became a partner, had their first museum show. So there's a sentimental attachment to this space and what, the, what it allowed uh, to be done. The project room that we made is um, uh, 26 feet high, um, which is which is the it's the tallest gallery in the MoMA um, arsenal of galleries, um, and it's the first gallery in the sequence of galleries and uh, performance spaces that we uh, brought to MoMA. This is the DSNR edition. This is the only part of the project that where we actually made the freestanding space that we're in. The idea with this edition was that we would give MoMA a whole bunch of different spaces with different uh, characters, uh, characteristics and qualities. Very tall, very short, very lit, very dark, very light, uh, with a view, without a view, viewable from the street. All of these qualities and conditions find their way into this series of interlocked galleries uh, that are in this building uh, that, that allow um, the art to be shown in ways that were not not possible before. This set of spaces, more than any in the expansion, represents MoMA's new concept of curation, which is without borders, boundaries, media, uh, divisions, um, but, but in a more fluid way that incorporates different media, time-based work, uh, all in one space. This is the architectural representation of that ambition. We're in the street level gallery. Again, one of our uh, big ambitions was to bring art to the street, to the people, free of charge. Um, in this gallery, there's a giant glass wall that opens to the street. It literally opens physically to allow for art to be delivered, but it, and it also opens visually to allow art to be seen. Currently behind this wall is a piece of art, a digital uh, piece of art that you can see from the street. It has wall text, et cetera. It's essentially a gallery di directed to passersby and to the citizens of New York. This also shows the, the current show, the way that it's working. It shows how they're thinking of curating now, which is without boundaries, the media will um, flow from gallery to gallery. There's no set place for uh, the shows. This show is, a, is an architecture and design show uh, curated by Paola um, Antonelli, um, which traditionally had been shown in specific galleries on the third floor, but now will float around the museum freely. We're standing at the top of the Blade Stair, and here you can yeah, get a sense of two of our architectural ambitions for the project. One was to use the space of the street and the pocket park across the street, which is, is visible only to this section of the almost full block long MoMA, as a kind of extension of the museum itself. And then to insert into a new vertical uh, core um, a stair, we call it the Blade Stair which is um, a feat of, of technology and engineering. Um, you can see that the, the central portion of the stair, the blade, is hanging from this floor plate um, on two giant beams that are concealed in the construction of the floor. All of the runs and risers, uh, the, the treads and risers of the stair are cantilevered from that blade. Nothing touches the walls of, of the two uh, outside walls of the core. space that can be transformed very quickly uh, to show different kinds of things. Live action with uh, natural acoustics or uh, amplified acoustics. Um, the walls are pivoting. They, they pivot 15 degrees to prevent flutter, uh, echo flutter from happening across the space. Uh, the ceiling grid is, is um, outfitted like the most high-end uh, black box theater. Uh, it allows for heavy uh, things to be rigged, um, different lighting configurations. Uh, performer access uh, and other things to be dropped. 
um, the um, the stage itself uh, can have a backdrop of projection screen, solar shade, or blackout screen. Um, on the side walls, there are acoustic banners that drop down to make it a very, very dead space. Most importantly, despite the fact that it's connected to the gallery uh, sequence so dramatically, it actually is very, very isolated and has a sound tra transmission rating of, of 60, uh, which is comparable to the best uh, concert hall, um, and then can transform inside itself to, to change its, uh, the quality of the acoustical performance of the room. Not only do we want to make this space be part of the gallery sequence, we also wanted to make this space be part of the city we did that by making the super high performance and very dramatic glass wall behind me, which has um, an embedded metal uh, frit in it, or a metal uh, mesh in it, and also a frit on the outside of the glass. And that cuts down and, uh, on sun and glare, um, but it still allows you to see through uh, to the outside. And the space is located right in front of one of New York City's famous pocket parks, so it's able to uh, essentially adopt the space across the street and the, and the space between these buildings to become uh, part of the space of MoMA. It really expands uh, MoMA's um, uh, kind of perceived space across the street. So we're um, at the Daylit Gallery. Um, this is another uh, gallery in the, in the section of um, galleries that DSNR designed specifically for MoMA, and it's another gallery that has uh, qualities and characteristics unlike any uh, other gallery in MoMA. The most obvious one is that it's got a giant glass window made up of five uh, individual pieces of glass that are all uh, over 20 feet tall and seven feet wide. This room will always be open to the outside. MoMA will curate it in such a way that um, the art can withstand light uh, and thus can be visible uh, from the street um, and for the first time and make a space where um, the art and New York City can merge up. I mean, after all, we are in the very middle of New York City, in the densest part of the city, and we wanted uh, the new moment to reflect that condition. Another thing to point out here um, is, the, is the transitions to the new galleries. Uh, previously, the portals used to be stainless steel. Um, in the new expansion, you can see them as blackened steel. Again, an attempt to make uh, the, the material palette be consistent in the new MoMA, but also to have a kind of drama, kind of a, a relief uh, in the portals, a dark relief, a shadowy relief uh, from uh, the, the light uh, galleries on either side. You'll also notice the floor, um, which is now eight inch wide uh, oak floor, um, which has been uh, lightened uh, in color. Um, it's, it's very different than the original MoMA floor, uh, which was a honey colored uh, oak uh, that was four inches wide. So that, this gives the new MoMA a kind of um, breath of fresh air, of course, uh, a kind of lightness, uh, but, but also, along with the stainless steel, a kind of gravitas that, that we believe this, uh, this gallery and institution needs. So, we're standing on the last uh, or first run of the Blade Stair, and from here, you can see um, the results of our attempt to make the museum much more porous and transparent. You can see all the way to the garden from 53rd Street, so essentially from 53rd to 54th Street, diagonally through several different spaces of MoMA, including spaces that, that have art in them. Uh, again, bringing um, the art back down to the street and to the city of New York.